Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 23 of From the Van. It's a podcast from my van where I have conversations with people who have relationships with residential vehicles, usually. See, today's episode features uh, an old friend of mine, Russ White. We went to college together. To my knowledge, he does not have, nor has he ever had, a relationship with a residential vehicle. But when you get an opportunity to talk to a guy this rad, you take it. Um, Russ is one of the most skillful and talented visual artists I've ever met. And uh, one of the things that I love about his work is that he's always got a pretty political agenda, um, a very serious subtext with uh, very usually whimsical overtones, which makes his work uh, super pleasing to look at and also um, educational, uh, or, or at least propaganda. <laughs> and, and we agree on most stuff, so that's cool. Um, we also did not record this in the van. It was really hot in Minneapolis, and so we recorded it in his art studio with a big box fan going. I've done my best to get rid of the noise, but um, there's going to be plenty of, uh, for you to gripe about if you choose to do so. But I think the substance of the podcast is going to make it all worthwhile. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, go to fromthevan.com, subscribe to all the stuff, and uh, watch the vlogs and all of that, blah, blah, blah. Please enjoy episode 23 of From the Van, featuring Russ White and this punitive car horn in the background. I don't know. I never really got into the, like, let's get fucked up and make some gonzo art right. thing, because my I've never been, like expressionistic mm -hmm. like this is kind of the most intuitive I've been in a long time yeah um, and this this is difficult for me because everything I do is usually so tight and so controlled uh, to like force myself like you can see right here I'm starting that was where I started and it's like super tight very rendered yeah, yeah, and yeah, I got to the rest and I was like alright stop it man uh, that's uh, not what this oh, and the reason that it's all crumpled up is because I've been doing these works on these like perfect surfaces that I prep and sand and get ready, paint and then seal and then they're ready for the pencils and all that. And this one I was like, I'm just gonna start with a crumpled up piece of paper, ball oh. it up, crumpled it up. It's got rips and shit in it. And then worst case scenario, I do a shitty drawing and a shitty piece of paper. And, and you just throw it away. And I throw it away. Yeah. And then I did what I think is a pretty good drawing on a shitty piece of paper and I was like, well fuck. And now I gotta like figure out how to frame this and like flatten uh, it out. So I just got double tack and put it down on a piece of board. But yeah. I guess the that uh, like anal mathematician in me, uh, since you're talking about that, mm -hmm. when we were looking at the um, the policemen who were all choking each other out there, yeah. I was looking at it and I was like, is there a head for each pair of arms? Mm -mm. And did you worry no. about that? There's only I'm trying to think. Most of the faces are actually just being choked out. And it's mostly headless arms. There's maybe a few where you can see the who's doing it. The head of who's doing it. Yeah. But the idea was with that piece is um, that the violence that is perpetuated systemically and individually is also violence against the person doing it. Like yeah. that it's I think that we're being violent to ourselves when we're violent to other people, mm. you know? And so that was kind of, that it's also a self-perpetuating cycle that if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and if you're gonna put everybody who's a perp in a chokehold, then you're gonna put every perp in a chokehold, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think we can dive deep on the philosophy of art if you want to. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Well, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> At the beginning, okay. <laughs> Russ White, we've known each other for 18 or 19 or 20 years or something? Yeah. When did you start? 19 years. Uh, David's thousand. Okay. Yeah. So you're two years behind me. Yep. So we would have met about then when you were a freshman. Probably freshman year, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, we sort of always hung out with the same people and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and how would you describe what you're doing now? Uh, what I tell people is um, I'm a visual artist. I work primarily in color pencil and sculptural installation. I'm getting a little bit more into mixed media and collage uh, as I try to sort of loosen up a little bit. Most of my work is sort of uh, about 
political or social issues, but I try to connect it to personal issues as well, or think about larger problems through personal lenses. And so mm-hmm. I've done a series of portraits, I've done uh, sculptural installations about my childhood or about our relationship, like thinking about uh, our relationship with the military through the lens of a child. Instance. Like, so I did a, a show a few years back that was my first uh, real solo show here in Minneapolis. It was called Macro Machines, and it was taking these, it's like the, um, the uh, monster truck we were talking about earlier, um, taking these uh, vehicles, usually military, sometimes civilian, and giving them a little twist. So like uh, a tank, or it was like a World War II era tank, that had uh, wood paneling like a Caprice Classic station wagon. So I was thinking about, uh, my parents used to have that station wagon when I was a kid. It was like a, you know, Chevy Caprice Classic, classic blue, and, you know, it had the little bench seat on the back. You'd sit backwards and ride around and get car sick. And um, that sense of security that being a kid in the back of a station wagon uh, trying to like harness that and connect it to something that's like malevolent and uh, industrial and you know this thing that is there to kill people that's the point to overpower um, but at the same time as a little kid as a little boy especially uh, I was really into tanks and soldiers and war and all that shit I used to go to uh, Army supply stores in Lancaster, like, South Carolina, and like I've got like an actual World War II grenade over there. It's been hollowed out, and we would go tromp. We looked like a fucking militia, like just tromping through with like little fake guns and shit. Um, and so like that, trying to think about the comfort level that we have with the military and the comfort that gives us to be in a country that has. You know, a military that's five times bigger than any, than the second largest military, or whatever, you know, whatever the metric is. Um, or another piece in that show was I uh, found a little child's desk on Craigslist and set it up. I used to make model airplanes when I was a kid, mostly because my older brother did it, and I was never that good at it because I wasn't patient enough to actually make it, like, get all the way through the thing. I would kind of make it and then be like, I don't really want to paint this and get decals on it, like, whatever. I was a little too weird and impatient for it, but uh, I found a box of my dad's old things that he had made, all these uh, you know, World War II planes. He's a baby boomer, so things from the 50s and, and yeah, I guess probably mid-50s when he was a kid. Um, and so I strung them all up in the gallery above it, and then on the table there's a newsprint laid out like you're making one, and the model is a Predator drone. Mm-hmm. So it's like... You know, this is where we're at now, and we still have that romantic relationship with the military when we take out the heroism of it and turn it into just cold, calculated death. So my point is, I'm a lot of fun to hang out with. Um, <laughs> I um, think you are. Oh, thanks. I've had a great time. Oh, thanks. Hanging out today. Scoot in a little bit. Uh, Can you tell me what to do? So I don't know. I mean, what do I do? I mean, in terms of my career and my livelihood, I make art. I do graphic design. I'm a writer and editor. Uh, I'm an editor for a magazine for a local nonprofit. I'm an editor for an arts events uh, website, NPLSArt.com. And I uh, kind of wear lots of hats and cobble a career together that way. But um, in the artwork world, I don't know, it's mostly colored pencils, but kind of trying to push out into something looser. Okay. And see where I go from there. How'd you get here? What's your What's your background? You grew um, up in Raleigh and ended up in. I grew up. I was born in Lancaster, South Carolina. I moved to Raleigh. My dad was a minister, so we moved every eight or ten years. His whole job was, um, excuse me, to basically go in and fix broken churches. So if there was a, excuse me, a church that had gone through some turmoil or uh, needed some fundraising or was, you know, there was a really great church in Mississippi that we moved to. Uh, that had amazing people in it and all that, but it was, uh, it needed some youth and some vitality. So he came in, helped him raise money, helped him fix the roof, helped him bring in new congregation and kind of revitalize. Like I moved in Raleigh, I was in a youth group with like 30 kids or something. 
when we moved to Jackson, I was a youth group. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go hang out with all the like old ladies in the congregation. They would like, take me to go get fried catfish and shit. And it was great. <laughs> <laughs> that does Yeah, no, it was great. Um, but at the same time, I was a grumpy little punk rock teenager who didn't know who the hell he was or what he was doing. So moving from, you know, the, the research triangle where there's Chapel Hill is right there. I mean, my first concert was... George Clinton and the P-Funk All-Stars, the Ritz and Raleigh, you know, and I was 13, and I was like, whoa, okay. Did this your folks like, take you to that? No, my youth minister did. No uh, shit. Yeah, okay. and he leaned in at one point, and he was like, he took a bunch of us, and we had all gotten permission and everything, and it was just like, so there was just like a cloud of weed smoke. So he was just like, don't breathe, or I'm going to lose my job. And I was like, all right, I'll try not to. And just don't have too much fun. Uh, and then from there, moving to Jackson, Mississippi, I was just like, what? But I think, I mean, Jackson's a lovely place full of lovely people, uh, great food, but I think I probably would have been, like, miserable on purpose anywhere, but that gave me a really good focus. Like, I'm going to be pissed off about this, (laughs) and then punk and hip-hop gave me something even beyond, like, there's, like, teenage angst where it's just like, fuck you, mom, I don't don't need your shit, whatever. I never got into that. My parents were always very reasonable, and right. I always understood their rules, and they made sense to me. I was like, well, I don't need to go like raise hell or yeah. whatever. I'm pissed about politics. You know? This gave you something concrete and yeah. real, even if it's on behalf of maybe a demographic that you didn't completely belong to, to be upset about. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, dude, I was, I spent the 90s listening to Dead Kennedy, so I was like right. pissed off about Ronald Reagan. You know, mm-hmm. I was like, all right. You Pay attention to what's actually happening now. There's plenty of things to be pissed off about. Uh, but, you know, that gave me sort of a thing to focus my angst and my teenage bullshit on. Right. And it's carried through into the work that I do now, to where I'm still fucking pissed off. Do you? <laughs> so there are two. We were, talking about, we were talking about your dad being like, sort of like surprisingly. Um, like accepting, yeah. When you began to you. identify as a atheist or yeah. whatever, um, and it sounds like there's there's some of that in your old youth minister that took you to the oh yeah, he was super shoot. cool. Oh yeah, too, right? yeah, yeah. This was in Raleigh, uh, and uh, I think his name was Mark Gammon. He's a really cool guy, and that was that was the atmosphere I grew up in in the church, which is like, you know, it's cool. We're all people. It's all hanging out. We can, you know. We can cuss and we can listen to, you know, he, he was in a band and they like, played Sex Pistols covers or whatever, you know, it was uh-huh. like, yeah. I did not have any of the traditional Christian, like, you know, tisk tisk kind of atmosphere, okay. which was great. Um, I just had to go to church every week, yeah. you know, because that was, that when you're a preacher's kid, you're part of a sort of a public face mm-hmm. of a political family, essentially, whether you like it or not. Do you, and if I ever ask you anything you don't want to answer, okay. of course, um, do you feel like you're, is your dad playing a political game, or is he a totally accepting true believer, or uh-huh. or does he have... Uh, You'd have to ask him that. Okay. Maybe. I mean, that's... Because you I said mean, you've had a bunch of... Uh, Conversations about theology. Yeah. Oh, that's a real deal for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, he believes it, but um, he comes at it from, I guess, sort of two different ways. I think maybe there's the theological aspect. He, he, we talk a lot about Reinhold Niebuhr, who, much to my own shame, I've never actually read, but through all these talks with my dad, I've kind of understood um, as sort of being. A cynical optimist, mm-hmm. or maybe an optimistic cynic, or something along those lines, where it's kind of like what we were talking about with a comedian, like, I'm shit and you're shit too, and isn't that wonderful? Mm-hmm. You know, um, and understanding, like, I think the way that the, and I am not a Christian, so, like, <laughs> I'm not speaking from a place of deep faith, I'm speaking from a place of nor am I speaking from a place of scorn, but I'm speaking from a place of, like, academic understanding yeah. and appreciation for these stories and the cultural impact they've had. Um, but the, like, the story of, of 
Jesus being killed to, you know, somehow reconcile all of our sins, which never really made sense to me. Uh, you know, the way my dad frames it in our conversations and in his sermons is that the Romans thought they were doing the right thing. Because here's this crazy guy who's coming up, he's stirring up a bunch of shit, he's heretic. causing all the problems. Yeah. Well, it's not even a heretic, he's just a fucking problem. Yeah. And he's, he's a cult leader, and people are getting rowdy out in the colony or whatever. Um, so if we just, like, take care of this guy, it's going to probably stop there from being riots and, and all this insurrection or whatever. So the idea was that we're going to do evil for the sake of good. And so that's a very, I think, and I hope I'm not misstating it, uh, Niburian concept of, like, the deep irony of human morality. That we think that we're trying to do good, and, you know, it's the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Niebuhr's the one who wrote the Serenity Prayer that's uh, used in AA a lot, which is, God grant me the serenity to... Accept things I cannot change, something like that. Uh, uh, change the things I cannot accept, or something like that. Or, or, the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like my um, mom's favorite. She's got it posted all over her Yeah, I think house. I just butchered it, but... Oh, yeah, we definitely did, but yeah. something along those lines. It's really yeah. nice. Um, and so that kind of... Uh, it's not even dualistic, it's just like a nuanced view of yeah. things. And so Dad is coming at... And so also I am coming at the idea of spirituality as being... Her religion, I guess, as being in service to... Um, sort of uh, intellectual and academic understanding of how fucking crazy it is to be human. The human condition. Yeah. yeah. But then also having, I think, where because I don't really need, I don't need Jesus to get to that. And like you can right. look around and realize that. And I think where yeah. like Christianity comes in for him to help is that it gives then that moral imperative to do something about it. Right. To help. So I think that then Jesus and that story and everything before and since is, I guess, sort of something to help struggle against just nihilism in the face of absurdity. Right. But I think I got instilled with enough of that ethos that I was like, I don't need this story anymore. The story doesn't really make sense to me. And it's fine, it's great, but it's also caused a lot of damage and death and yeah. turmoil for the past 2,000 years, and I think Jesus was a cool dude, man, but, you know, <laughs> like... It's so weird for me, know. the allegories are so beautiful, but then the hard line, which it sounds like you're, you know, I know I know plenty of theologians who aren't assholes, you know what I mean, and don't think that you have to do X right. to not be a piece of shit or whatever, Yeah. Um, and it, that doesn't seem to be the, like, prevalent notion in that community or whatever. Well, there's a lot of different communities and that's yeah. the weird thing that I've never understood about it, is that anybody like, why would you be Presbyterian instead of Methodist? What's the fucking difference? Yeah. Other than the way that maybe the church itself is structured. Uh, but then, I understand why I wouldn't want to be a Southern Baptist or a Jehovah's Witness or something that's more hardline. Uh, but for me, to have somebody come and knock on my door and be like, I'm, I do have a minute to talk about Jesus or whatever. I'm just like, no, man. I mean, fuck you. Fuck you for being so arrogant that you can come in and... Try to fix me. But you're using this rubric, this beautiful story, and you're using this one sliver of interpretation of it and then saying that that's right. I'm just like, you could, how many different variations... Of Christianity, or how many different denominations? There's got to be dozens, if not hundreds, and that's not even including, you know, ones that are sort of just off on a lark, like unincorporated, whatever, yeah. non-denominational. And to be like, to have the gall to be like, nah, I got it figured out. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I mean, you're gonna get started, but you know, <laughs> literalists. I'm just like, no, this is a fucking document. This was written by people. Part of, part of what I learned from my dad about the Bible was, because he's a writer, he had to write a sermon every week and mm. give a speech every week. This is like a five-page paper he has to write every fucking week to, and stand up and present. Yeah. Uh, and he's using the text. So there's always a scripture. And um, it's like, these guys are great writers. 
Yeah. You know? Like, that's, he's a writer, he appreciates their writing. And if you look at uh, Mark, for instance, it's written, it's very, like, brass tacks, we're going to get it done, it's the shortest book of the Gospels, and it ends very abruptly, and then there's a sort of stylistic change and this other things added on. And that was the first one that was written, I think, within, I don't know, like a hundred years of Jesus dying or something. And um, it's been a while since all my college religion courses, uh, so I apologize <laughs> for getting all my facts wrong, I'm sure. But, um, I'm not going to know the difference. Oh, good. So. Okay. So I'm right about everything. Uh, yeah. The point of that was, Jesus is coming back, you guys. Jesus, their second coming is happening. It's happening right now. This, this generation, he's coming, and it like almost ends mid-sentence. And then you get into Luke, and it's later on. Matthew, later, they're, they're further away. And, I mean, if you want proof that the Bible was written by people, look at Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. There's two different creation stories that happen in completely separate orders. So, which is it? If you're going to be a creationist and you're going to read the first two chapters of the whole fucking book and not realize that they're entirely <laughs> contradictory, don't come tell me that the Earth is 6,000 years old. I mean, that's ludicrous. And also, it's you know negating the beautiful brilliance of the world, the natural world. I mean, you find a dinosaur fossil that wasn't put there by some asshole to trick us. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. We were driving through Montana yesterday, mm. and we, uh, what do we got here? Oh, here you battery problem? No, 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 we're all good. I just have to restart this every once in a while. Yeah. We were driving through Montana yesterday, and we, we slept at this place, at this wonderful, one of the nicest rest, rest stops I've ever seen. Hmm. There was a big semi-truck with, like, cows in it. Oh, baby. And the cows were, like, bussing, and, like, you could hear them, rocking like, around. rocking around. And I was like, oh, this makes me really sad. Can like, we man. go let them free? <laughs> like, yeah. uh, they don't know yeah. what's going yeah, on. Yeah, Colette almost had me doing some, like, Peter and, terrorist and animal like, liberation. He was like, they're probably just going to another farm. I'm like, yeah, fuck you. No. I mean, cows aren't going to do very well in the wild. Uh, it's true. Well, in the wild of Montana, they'd probably be fine. There were I cows so. everywhere. They could find Bison rides. did just fine. It's true. Uh, there were lit- it was just cow- cows and yard sushi everywhere. <laughs> yard sushi. That's what I started calling the, uh, the, the rolls, rolls of hay. hay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Little mock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the crazy thing is, at this rest stop, which was between a whole bunch of, like, uh, anti-choice billboards, like, miles and miles and miles of anti-choice yeah. billboards, where you know that the primary uh, demographic there is creationism, there's this giant plaque at the rest stop talking about the fact that this rock formation, the Hell's Creek rock formation, or Hell Creek rock formation, is where more than half of the Tyrannosaurus Rex remains found in the world no were shit. found. Wow. And it's like, cool. it's hilarious to me that think wow. in the, thinking in the heart of creationist territory, yeah. a lot of the evidence <laughs> of the Earth being millions and millions and millions of years old was found there. Uh, for what, man? I mean, for... A book for control? I mean, like, why why take a big fat shit on something that's amazing? Like, yeah. oh my god, this is where all the T-Rexes live. Yeah. And you're like, nah, I believe that. Because mm-hmm. it makes me feel it's weird fake. about homosexuality, you know? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, what? <laughs> huh? Uh, so, but we were, talk- we were talking earlier about your art being, it sounded like, it between the... the Caprice Classic, Mm -hmm. and the, which my parents had that, I remember riding around in that thing backwards, and it was terrifying, and, and consoling me so at the same time, looking at the (laughs) guy driving by, I'm going to go back to my Game Boy, Uh, (laughs) but these, these, you talk about the station wagon, and the armaments of World War II mm-hmm. being things that gave us the sense of false security, yeah. right? Um, but, I mean, we're talking about a giant well, it's real secure. elephant in the room, right? Which, which is, elephant? Well, what we've been talking about the last 20 minutes, uh-huh. which, is, which is this security blanket of, yeah. of theology and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. religion and whatnot. 
Is that why you're doing this? Is this why you're mad? <laughs> <laughs> why am I fucking mad? I don't know. Because I read the goddamn news every day. Um, I think that's fair. Yeah, there's a lot to be mad about. But I realized recently, because I've done all this work about police, for instance. I never had any trouble with police. So, yeah. I got pulled over once in high school, and that was for uh, passing in a no-passing zone. And <laughs> I was right and he was wrong, so he gave me a warning. And that's it. Now, why do I do a lot of work about police when I don't have that tangible thing because I guess it's empathy or something but you know I know people who've been pulled over 60 fucking times in their life and they're my age you know and it's because they don't look like me and I think it's uh I kind of honed in on this and I haven't quite figured it out yet but I was writing a, a proposal not too long ago and it suddenly clicked which is one reason that I enjoy writing is that it kind of makes you work through those ideas on the fly uh, is that I'm really interested in power and what is it what does it mean to have power what does it mean like what's the power in privilege and what's the power uh, in individual people like there's good and the bad side to all that so I've done this series of portraits that's like very celebratory and some of them are kind of standoffish but I think the whole series is kind of joyful and it's about finding the power seeing the power in people and that's kind of what I want to do with these new collages, is kind of play around and find, I think they're like a really good composition, it just has like energy in it, you know, in the same way that I think when you connect with somebody, they just, you have that energy, they're like, oh shit, I'm picking up, I can put them down, kind of thing. But there's also the power of, you know, I literally have power over your body, and I can exert that as, a policeman or as a judge or as whatever um, and that I think as somebody who's always I've led a very privileged and lucky life I've always resented that about myself I guess so I guess it's kind of a guilt in a certain way um, I don't really think about it as guilt or shame I just think about it in terms of my own life as I'm very grateful I try to have gratitude and I try to be Try to have gratitude and humility about the life that I'm lucky enough to have, and then um, try to understand and maybe help other people understand why they don't have that same gratitude and humility, and they take the privilege that they have as a white person or a straight person or a man or a cop or whatever, and use that against somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's just like why. Why do you fucking do that? It sucks. And so I think that was something, I mean, you know, we talk about my dad being, like, using religion for good. I mean, he was working, you know, 100 hour weeks for the most part when I was a kid and didn't see him that often because he was on the board of, like, every soup kitchen, like, helping, trying to, like, help in the community in a way that wasn't just like, I'm gonna stand up here and tell you what I think and why you're wrong and all that shit. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 we need to invest our time and energy in people that need our help. And, and isn't the that point. the whole, like, what would Jesus do? Like, the actual answer yeah. to the question? Yeah. Like, sounds like he a good dude. probably would get a bunch of bracelets made in China and make money <laughs> off of it. He would actually be out there, like, you know, living with poor people and helping them. Yeah. Or ministering them or washing their feet, you know, and that's gratitude and humility, you know. Yeah. I mean, th this is the craziest thing to me about Christianity is that we have this, like, pauper king, you know, like, he hung out with prostitutes and thieves and murderers and, like, ostensibly terrible people. I mean, in the Bible, they're fishermen and shepherds, but a lot of times back then, shepherds, that was like, the, like, okay, you're a fuck up. You're gonna go out and feel cheap, stay the fuck away from the rest of us, and get out there. Like, that was a sign of, like, you're a piece of shit. You were the lowest rung. You're banished. Go tend the fields, kind of thing. As I understand it. Um, anthropologists may tell me I'm wrong about that, but I don't know. That's, that's my understanding of it. So you have this person who's in a sort of a Mother Teresa tech way, like, living amongst the least. Uh, and then we call him a king and a lord 
have this very feudal language around the Almighty that I think. I don't think that came from Jesus, you know? I mean, somebody who's there hanging out washing the feet of prostitutes and lepers is not like, man, I'm great, you know? Look at me. I'm fucking great. You should put me on, you know, gold-leafed cathedrals or whatever. You know, that that came later. I think that's the lens of power through which the story is more corrupted. It's a damn shame. But we think, I mean, Oh Lord, you know, wait, Lord? What are you talking about? That's feudalism. Yeah. That means that you're a serf. And that's not God is love, then you shouldn't be, you know, out in the field with Dennis and, you know, the Holy Grail, like, slopping mud in the bucket or whatever, you know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I told you, hang on, that's fun. <laughs> I, so, you know, we come from, yeah, let's do another beer. Okay. <laughs> Here, I'm going to stop this and restart it. What else? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I struggle with this all the time, too, right? Is it, we come from very similar places in terms of um, our relationship with, like, power and religion and privilege, as we've been talking about, and there's... This, there's this it's flying off his face. He's got shit in his ear. Oh, yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. There's this. Uh, I have this impulse sometimes to divest myself of privilege. Mm. But I, when I think about it, like logically, that doesn't make any fucking yeah, sense. How do you do this? Right? Well, and I mean, that's the thing. Is to the degree that you believe that Jesus was the uh, the all powerful son of the all powerful, sure. right? Um, then the dude decided to be broke. Mm. He decided to be homeless. He decided yeah. not to live in a mansion or yeah. whatever, right? Um, but the, the the point comes, it's like, if you have tools and access, isn't it better to leverage those things to, to try to communicate um, solidarity to the downtrodden and to communicate uh, that empathy is a goal to the privileged and the people who are exerting power over other people. Yeah, I think there's certain aspects of privilege that are inescapable, which is like, I can't change the color of my skin or the fact that I'm a cisgender, straight male. Um, and society, as it's currently structured and operating, is always going to benefit me because of those yeah. things. I can't really do anything about that short of pointing out patriarchal bullshit, uh, any kind of homophobic, transphobic, xenophobic, ageist, whatever, ableist, any of that, pointing that out to people, which I think is a large part of leveraging your privilege of being like, hey, okay, I'm going to stand up right now because, you know, for instance, I'm, uh, I'm a, a man who has always been encouraged to speak up in class or at meetings or wherever and there's people who aren't comfortable with that because they haven't been cultured to that or they've been treated shittily when they've tried that or whatever you know um and that's also sort of like using any talents you have towards a greater good um i don't know if you can necessarily get rid of privilege i mean the whole point of talking about privilege is not to take it away from people but to give it to everybody else right you know, so it's not like I need to, um, it's not like I'm a bad person, it's just that other people are treated badly, and I want that to stop, if possible. Um, and it's like somebody, I'm trying to think of a, a quote that I shared not too long ago on Instagram, but it was something like, to say that you're speaking from a place of privilege means that uh, you probably don't have a lot of experience in this situation, and so your perspective does not include what we're talking about right now, which is, it's a, 
I'm not really getting the eloquence of that statement, but essentially, like, you can't, you, when you're talking about how racism isn't a problem in America in 2019, as a white person, you're saying, I just I don't see it, and I don't see color. You know, it doesn't seem like it's a problem, I mean, anybody can a black president, you know. It's like, okay, you're speaking from a place of privilege, and then that can that person can say, well, I've had a hard life, man. Like, what are you talking about? And then I've had to work for everything I've had. It's like, yes, 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 no, no, no. I'm not saying that. We're not saying you're a bad person. We're saying that you don't understand the scope of the problem because you have not had to deal with the consequences of that problem. Right. And so you just don't see it. And that's what being woke is about. You haven't woken up into the problem. You know, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's just like, oh shit. Okay. Yeah. And like I had that moment with the term white supremacy because you know we grew up in the '90s and it was like white supremacists were like the idiots on Jerry Springer. You know, it was like here's the Klan members and Cletus the Slackjaw Yokel who's gonna show up and like throw a chair or whatever, uh, skinheads and idiots. You know. Mm-hmm. Because they kind of lived on the fringes. That's what a white supremacist is. And I was driving around here, and someone on being interviewed on NPR called the Democratic governor at the time of uh, Minnesota a white supremacist. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. That's you're, That's really what's going to alienate a lot of people from your message, you know? And the more they talked, to the more I thought about it, I understood that, like, oh, no, no, no. What you're, you're not saying that they're a member of the Klan. I'm not saying that they're explicitly being racist and white supremacist, but the policies that they are putting in place and upholding enforce and, you know, undergird or are undergirded by a philosophy of white supremacy, whether you fucking realize it or not. Mm-hmm. And then that's the kind of moment I'm like, okay, now I'm seeing, you know, it's like when somebody I forget what the statement was, but I was, you know, I was thinking like, isn't it fucked up that in this country, every single good thing we have to fight for tooth and nail? Yeah. And even once we get it, we have to keep fighting for decades so we don't lose it. Mm-hmm. Like voting rights, those are being eroded now. Abortion rights, those are being eroded now. Women's rights, children's rights, rights for anybody who isn't a landowning white person. Um, Man, why is it that it is so difficult to get the right thing done? And somebody was like, yeah, that's because it's not that the system isn't working. It's that the system is working exactly as it was designed. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about this yesterday, actually, on the drive. Is my, um, my main mentor in law school... Her name's Patricia Leary, and she doesn't. She, I think she still doesn't operate an email address. Wow! <laughs> yeah, dude. All right. She looks like a professor from Hogwarts. Somebody should introduce her and, to dial-up at some point. Uh, she just she's a she's a luddite. She nice. she likes it, and she's a luddite. And she got like internet famous a couple of years ago for wearing a Black Lives Matter. And this woman looks like mm. she was wearing a Black Lives Matter T-shirt into class. Yeah. And. Um, kind of rude about this. Yeah, she made she made the whole internet go crazy for a uh-huh. couple of days, and she doesn't have an email address, um, and she looks like uh, Mrs. Claus, right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, but one of the one of the most important messages that she always tried to convey was that, and this this goes back to the white supremacy thing, is that mm-hmm. like you don't look at we always look at uh, negative. Conduct that has negative uh, repercussions, especially with respect to marginalized communities and stuff, as where is the intent? Where is the motive? And a lot of times, the people who perpetuate these systemic forms of oppression aren't trying to fuck somebody. Right. The, so, so the question isn't, What's the motivation or where is the intent? The question is, follow the money. Whose interest does right. this serve? Yeah. Who does this who does this help? And if the answer is always the landed white man, mm-hmm. 
there, there goes your white supremacy. You have to, look, you have to look backwards and you have to look forwards and you have to mm-hmm. say, what are the consequences of this? And you know, what can we reasonably assume is going to happen because exactly. of this? Yeah. And yeah, what are the reasons? You can, just, you can rationalize anything at the moment. Correct. Right. Like, well, I just I just thought it better to lock my doors right now, you know, or something. You're like, really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know. And it's hard when you don't when you're talking in generalities because it's easier to to deal with a specific instance, but I think the main thing is just recognizing that as a culture, as a society, we have that bias, and to look for it, in every, we have many biases, uh, mm-hmm. and to look for racism, white supremacy specifically, um, patriarchy, and um, all of that, all that fear-based bullshit in everything, and you'll probably find it in most of it, and even the well-intentioned, you know, all the liberals of the world, you know, well, you guys are fucking up too, mm-hmm. so, um, and it, I think also, uh, you know, it's funny that we're here and we have, you know, recording equipment and all that, and we're putting this thing out into the world, I think that one thing that's important to do when you have privilege is to, to shut the fuck up. And like make space for other people yeah. to talk, which I'm not that good at. So I'm just like, I got opinions, I got things to say, and this is wrong. And it's, you know, I've noticed that being on boards or committees or something that I'm like, why is that person not talking? And this other person is talking all the time, you know, and things like that. And it's just like, okay, I don't want to be that person. So, like, I've always got something to say, I'm sure, but I can take a minute. Mm-hmm. You're like, all right. Or like as being an editor, I'm like, okay, well, who do I not know anything about? Let's write something about them. You know, who can I give a platform to and some space to and, and be alone to? Uh, and how can you accomplish these things with your art? I was at an artist talk not too long ago, and that was a question from the audience, uh, was like, how do you approach how did you approach accessibility for the show? And the artist, who I believe was uh, Latino and in a uh, space that's uh, very diverse and everything, didn't really have an answer for that. I've thought about that question a lot because, I mean, being an artist is one of the most fucking egotistical things <laughs> yeah. to ever do. I mean, nobody asked me to make any of this, you know? I mean, when you have a job, you're paid because somebody's asking you to do something. And here I'm just like, well, I'm just a guy in the world. I'm just going to make some stuff and then try to create demand for me, you know? So it's very egotistical. It's very easy to be completely up your own ass. And I don't know what the answer to that question is. Like, how do I, other than bringing other people into my work, so like taking photos of friends and using them for portraits and trying to have a relationship with the subjects and with the audience and all that and then trying to make space for hard questions during talks and things like that um, but still it's a very fraught business it's very strange and um, it's also weird because you're dealing in like rarefied business I mean this is art is not cheap and part of that is I mean, it can be, but you need to make a lot of it. You need to sell a lot of it in order to maintain any kind of you know, financial stability for practice. Um, or you just have a separate stream of income and you just make work and whatever you get to shit it sells. But uh, it is difficult sometimes to square being an artist who's like critical of uh, you know, systems of control and working within a capitalist framework where it's just like, I sure hope that someone comes and buys my expensive artwork, you know, and God bless them. I love selling artwork, placing artwork, having some someone take something that I made and have it in their life, in their home. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. And I try to do that with cheap stuff and prints and things so that people, you know, it's like, I can't afford artwork for the most part, you know. We bought one piece of artwork recently that was kind of like our first piece of artwork and we put it on a credit card, you know. Just like, okay, we'll just pay this off over the next four or five months and that'll be fine. Um, Because we loved it. I want to have this in our home. It's awesome. 
Um, so it's weird, and I, you know, I'm trying to find where I am uh, between being an artist and a preacher, because I think that's kind of in my blood. Also being a professor, there's a lot of professors in my family, so I think that kind of like pedagogical, like, let me teach you something kind of thing is in my blood, in my head, all the time. And I'm trying to maybe get, step back from that a little bit, so that I'm, like I think I said earlier, asking more questions than trying to give answers. Sure. I think it's more interesting anyway. I said, who the fuck am I? Well, th that's good. I... <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> I want to... I, I we we were talking earlier sort of about the the me mechanics of whether it's the mechanics of persuasion or um, the the vocabulary of messaging getting people to question shit or getting people to understand your point mm -hmm. we were talking about you know sort of the death of satire in our current political climate and yeah. stuff. Like, what, what have you? What's your migration in terms of where you were three or four years ago um, to where you're, where you feel like you might be headed in terms of? Because I know, it, in terms of my practice, like, since I've since I've known you, since yeah. the first shit that I've seen you mm -hmm. do. The other hilarious uh, charcoal drawing that I had of yours, which I don't have anymore, I have a picture of it. Uh, it was his all in capitals story, I think. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what it was. I think it was a nutsack crushing another, like a, a guy or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> And, no, about right and it was it, but it was like it was this beautiful four-celled cartoon oh, okay. commentary on the patriarchy, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was super overt. Yeah. Like if you if Talking you wanted to yeah. uphold the the systems of misogynistic oppression, this thing would be like very offensive to you. Right. To me, it was hilarious. Right. 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 right? Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. so I grew up listening to Dead Kennedys a lot, and one thing that Jello always did, Jello the Opera's a great singer, mm -hmm. is that he wrote songs from the perspective of the villain, and so that's where I got the sense of satire of like that, and probably you know Monty Python and stuff like that. But that sense of like going behind the mask of what makes the villain tick yeah. to like understand, and um, we're at a point now where I think the I don't think the villain is even that deep. I mean, the villain is a sheet of paper. You mm -hmm. know, he's just one dimensional. It's not just him. It's it's a lot of people that are engaged in this very bald um, thing where you can't even. You can't make fun of it because it's already making fun of itself. I mean, it's like it's like you can't make fun of ICP by putting on clown makeup. Right. Because they already put clown makeup on. Mm -hmm. and they're like, fuck you. You can't make fun of us. And ICP is great. You know, they're, that's a whole community doing their thing. And that same thing has happened to, you know, conservative America where they're just like, oh, you think that we're going to be a bunch of crazy idiots on a tank with a flag and an eagle and, and you know, and hatred in our hearts? That's, that sounds Here like a t-shirt to me. You know? and then You're they the wear, dumb ones. They wear that t-shirt, you know? And um, I'm sure on the right people feel the same way about the left. Whatever, you know? But the point is that, like, irony, I think, is not... Um, uh, not as useful as I think we thought it used to be. Whether it was or not, I don't know. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, high school in the 90s, and I think the 90s were a very kind of ironic time. There's a lot of satire, and there's a lot of, like, ribbing and using comedy to get at. And we thought that if you made fun of something, it would pop the balloon of the powerful, mm -hmm. and now the powerful just want your attention. So if you give them any, yeah, yeah. If you give them any attention, it's still sucking the oxygen out of the room and so, not making any headway, which is why 
traditionally, this is why Trump is such a surprise, because traditionally there was a hundred different things that happened over the course of the 18-month campaign that would have sunk any other candidate because it got played on CNN. And Trump is different in that regard because he he is he is Ghostbusters 2. He is Vigo the Carpathian. He is the pink ooze. So if if you feel outrage and hatred towards him, he feeds on that shit. Yeah. And it becomes hatred and outrage and it just makes the monster stronger, you know? And I'm not on the Marianne Williamson like we just need love tip just yet. I appreciate where she's coming from, but you know, that is something I think like we need to take off our masks and not wear the mask of the villain anymore because the villain is right here. And it's it's also like satire is funny. So we were thinking, oh, well, if you deliver a serious message with a funny punchline, it'll land, it'll get through. And I just don't think that things are all that funny anymore, you know? And it can help, but it's, it's not sufficient. You know? And it's also, I don't think, effective. Because we live in such a place where it's like, I mean, the time we're living now is bonkers because it's so bifurcated. It's I was quadrificated or whatever. I mean, everybody is working from their own set of facts, which is insane. We all live in different universes. So if you listen, if you watch MSNBC, you have a vision of what's actually happening in the world. If you watch Fox News, you have a completely and utterly different version of what's actually real in the world. If you read Breitbart, it's even crazier. If you listen to NPR, you probably are fine and you understand what's happening, but <laughs> you're probably not digging as deep as you should. And so there's, we, we're able to curate our own realities in a way that I don't think we've been able to before. They've always been curated for us, which is problematic in its own way, but um, when you approach someone who believes something different, they are in a different fucking dimension than you are at this point. Mm -hmm. So we're not even working from the same set of reality. So to satirize that reality does not does nothing. You know, either they get defensive because you're making fun of me, or like with the Colbert Report, they think you're being earnest. They don't even realize. Yeah. It. And yeah. so I think that is where an approach of it's like when Sarah Silverman uh, got attacked on Twitter, like somebody, what somebody, time? somebody. Well, you yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Well, she got trolled by some dude, yeah. and uh, and her comeback to him was that she looked at his profile, and he had a bunch of posts about how he was suffering from like tremendous back pain and was having all his medical bills and all this problem. And she's like, "I'm sorry that you're hurting," you know. And so she came at it immediately. Her response was not defensive or aggressive; it was empathetic. And then they developed a relationship. She raised a bunch of money to help with his health care, which is another thing, is that, wow. you know, the 1% is up here, like, fleecing us all so that we're all fucking miserable because we can't afford to keep ourselves healthy and well-fed and educated and all this. And so we're pissed off, and it's easier to be pissed off at each other. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we're living that time. So it's a great division, and always have in this country, because we've always been pitted against each other for bullshit reasons um, and we do some of that ourselves um, but that's I think that's got so much more power to me to come at somebody with earnestness and empathy than with snark at the same time if you're a fucking asshole you know we need to be earnest and being like stop being an asshole like, we don't need to give everybody a hug you know? mm -hmm. they probably need a hug but there's levels of appropriateness, you know, so, I don't know, I ain't got the answers. You don't need to feed the assholes with more asshole. Like, it's, just, it's just, I mean... It inflates them even more. Yeah, you know? it's, I mean, it makes that toaster dance. And, yeah. You know, it's bad, it's real bad. So we need, we need that PMA, we need that love, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's taller. How or at least they challenge each other. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we need. There's a. Don't attack. There's, an, there's an honesty to yeah. earnestness. I mean, that's what it is. And um, 
I think that's that's important is to be like, wait, 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 why are you doing what you're doing? You know, and that's why, you know, like a lot of people I have, you know, fake arguments with phantoms in my head, like when I'm taking a shower, like I'll think about, like, oh, I'm having an argument with a random person that I've never met that doesn't exist, whatever, you know? And I try to remember in those fake arguments to be like, what happened to you? What's wrong? You know? mm -hmm. and not be just like, well, you're wrong. Right. Even though they probably are. I mean, I guess what I'm, what the, the less abstract question that I was trying to ask a, a few minutes ago uh -huh. is that, like, you have, you have the American flag that is the um, jumble of colors that you see. Um, TV test screen pattern. Yeah, the test screen pattern. Mm -hmm. And then you have the the American flag that is the caution barricade, right? Mm -hmm. And you have all these beautiful satirical pieces. Is that the pin you have? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> I just put the pieces yeah, together. Yeah. He still has it when we moved wow, out of the nice. apartment. And he's got it yeah. in the van. He's like, yeah. you have to keep it. That was, that was a way in which I tried to use my platform as an artist to help was that I tried to for shows, I try to partner with nonprofits and give a portion of sales. So a portion of right. all those sales went to Planned Parenthood and Southern Poverty right. Law Center because there was a huge spike in hate crimes and in uh, hate activity and then also in obviously anti-abortion, uh, anti-choice ideology at that point. So that was something where I was just like, okay, well, if I have an audience, I can try to use some of that leverage to give back in some way. Yeah. I bought I'm a piece sorry. of art. I supported Planned Parenthood. Oh, <laughs> and, I okay, okay. <laughs> and, and I uh, supported the Southern Poverty Law Center. Pri privilege checked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're sorry. good. You're good. Like a year, I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to pat myself yeah. on the back. <laughs> How many years ago was that? You got some catching up. Okay. Where well, your, I voted. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. I just got a tattooed on my chest. Yeah. That's a good way to be. I have a shirt. I used to make t-shirts, and I have one that just says, vote, you piece of shit. <laughs> just like, fucking vote. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ, to not vote is such an act of privilege to me. Uh -huh. It's just like, I don't like them. It's like, it's not a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. This is a real decision that has real impact for real people. And yeah. just because you don't feel it, it's, yeah. it's yeah. horseshit. Yeah. Anyway. I'm sorry <laughs> I interrupted you. I just, like... Made yeah, that happen. That all happened in my brain. Flags, and I yes. was like, "Shit!" Uh, well, I was just, cool I was going to say, it's like between those and the and the um, the the vehicles, what the the Caprice um, tank mm -hmm. and the the cop car monster, uh, monster truck. truck. Those were to me hilarious pieces of satire. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, how? How do you perceive visual art, like asking a more nuanced and earnest question? Where are you going in terms of that? Like, I think this shit is beautiful. Oh, well, thanks. Personally, and yeah, you know, agree. it's a lot less overt than when the cops are choking each other out, obviously. Yeah. Which is from the same sort of. It's very interesting like a theme. Things. I mean, I think that this one, this piece in particular, for me, was about loosening up and getting less of a sense of control over uh, my practice, but I think in terms of the content of the drawing, it is actually about control, and it's about pieces called body politics, and so I was thinking about uh, having control over your own body, having the sense that people are trying to control your body, hold your body, tell you what to do with it, uh, grope your body, hug your body, all the different levels of human touch contact and then they even like holding up the body um, uh -huh. right there and I don't know if it's successful in that regard but it was successful for me in loosening up my practice you know in terms of just the drawing of it yeah um, but it, you know is the question sort of like where can nuance go that explicit satire can't or like no no it's not I I the, you got me convinced of the answer mm. to that question. The question isn't where can nuance go that satire can't. The question is how do you get 
a pointed question mm. without pointing it at somebody. You know what I mean? Is is like it's hard to it's it seems very difficult to empathize with another person in a mm. static piece of art, right? Mm-hmm. If if I can talk to you, I have a better chance of understanding what your trauma is. Right. And you've got me sold on the idea that that's what we need to do with each other right. to bring people, especially who are diametrically opposed to us, mm-hmm. over to the other side. Mm-hmm. But how do you do that in a piece of static artwork? I don't know. I, that's what I'm trying to figure out is, yeah. does it still have that power? And I think I just got really tired of my own preaching about, like, the things, I mean, here's the thing, it's like, you know, I'm on Facebook mostly so that I can see what other people are posting and keep up with events. Right. Now, I could be somebody who posts every single thing that pisses me off or every single thing that gives me hope or gives me joy or write a paragraph about my thoughts on politics or I could use it like Twitter or whatever. But I'm like, there's, there's a cacophony of voices mm-hmm. out there right now saying all the things that I would try to say and probably saying them better. So, okay, what? maybe I should focus on this, <laughs> and then what am I saying with this? And I think part of it is having... There's a... Somebody told me recently that they, they found my work to be very analytical. Which I think is a reasonable, not even criticism, but just a critical response to my work. Sure. It's, it's analytical, it's kind of uh, left brain, I guess, and it's very thought out and all that. Um, but I'm trying to I'm trying to find a little bit more of the magic. Mm-hmm. Because I think the magic is sorely lacking in most of everyday life. Because everyday life is kind of a drag for the most part, unless you're present enough to like look around and be like this amazing world we live in. There's just shit, you know, a quasar can pass all the way through you and not touch a single molecule kind of thing, you know. Um, or like, you know, you can be in love with someone, you can, whatever, you can make a connection with other people and trying to find some of that magic and reproduce it visually is kind of where I'm at right now with working on what the fuck is this? Mm-hmm you know, that we're a part of right now, and part of that is dealing with current events, part of that is dealing with more spiritual type things, but the uh, the thing I was thinking of was, um, I'm going to sound like a real dork here, but the lead singer from Tool, Maynard, uh, yeah, Tool. he, uh, nice, they've got an album coming up. Do um, they really? Yeah. First time in like 15 years. Uh, he was on, I think, Mark Maron's podcast or something. And um, at some point, he had the quote that uh, if you don't believe in magic as an artist, your artwork probably isn't very good. And I've taken that to heart, being still a very sort of agnostic, kind of scientifically minded, um, analytical artist. And like, there is. There's got to be some magic, and you have to look for it and try to find it, otherwise, that's the point, you're just making something that's like decorative and nice, and that's fine, but where's that thing that's just like, oh, you know, holy shit, and I don't know if I found it, and you catch little glimpses of it, if you're lucky, and then you make a connection with somebody who comes into your door and you're like, ah, I really like that, you know, or something, and Maybe it makes them change the way they think about the world, or maybe it just gives them a moment of magic. And you go, oh, shit, okay. Well, that's something. Because, I don't know, I mean, we all got the we all got the clock ticking. Um, oh, really? Yeah. What does that mean? Oh, uh, just <laughs> garden variety existential dread. <laughs> you know? um, and I think that uh, if we're not aware of, and again, grateful and humble in the face of that, like, wonder and amazement, and we're really missing out on, like, the whole fucking point of this whole thing. Yeah. Just like, man, this is a shit show. Jesus, it's beautiful. Uh Uh-huh. Um, let's talk about, uh, the Minneapolis art scene. Oh. 
Goodbye. Um, it's awesome. It's yeah. uh, what do you want to know? Uh, what's, what's the... Tell us about this badass building that we're in. Okay, so we are currently in the Casket Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis, uh, which was built in 1882 and uh, was a full-fledged casket factory. They had uh, uh, carpenters, upholsterers, uh, I believe funeral home directors up front, and then they also had there's a, a separate building. It's kind of a campus of buildings. Excuse me, there's also um, the factory where there's a large sculpture gallery and some other studios upstairs. And then a, another building called the Carriage House. And they literally made carriages there. So back before there were hearses, there were carriage hearses with horse You know, that's how the hearse operated, obviously. Um, and so it operated until 2005, and the current owners bought it and renovated it, uh, turned it into a five-story building plus three stories in the carriage house and two stories in the factory uh, to have over, I don't know, 100 plus art studios. So there's painters and sculptors and printmakers, there's a printmaking co-op upstairs, photographers, um, jewelers, uh, ceramicists, woodworkers, casting agencies, uh, sculptors, bronze sculptors, um, kind of just like there's like a, a guy who does these really amazing uh, little collage poems. Like he types poems on found images, and he mm -hmm. also runs um, a uh, like a therapy practice out of his studio. So it's kind of just like a buzz with lots of energy. And there's several buildings like that throughout all of Northeast. Um, and it forms the larger arts district. And there's a nonprofit called MEMA that I'm a part of. Um, and I'm, that's the magazine the editor for the Northeast Minneapolis Arts Association. They've been putting on a arts festival called Art of World the third weekend in May every year for 25 years. This will be the 25th year coming up. And there's like 30 or 40,000 people that come to it now. There's over 800 artists in 60 different locations. So it's like, it's a proper arts community. Yeah. And there's everybody from, you know, your Sunday painters and your like sort of hobbyists and people who are like, okay, well, I'm just going to do this because I love it and it's fun. And then there's an audience that comes at least once a year, if not more often. And then there's people who are full-time painters and that's what they do or full-time sculptors or whatever. And, uh... The difficulty is, so I moved here in 2014 with my wife, and I knew that she, her whole family lives around here, so I had been up here for our world in the past. I knew that if I was going to be part of a community, like I moved here and I only knew my in-laws, so I was like, that's not going to work. I love them, but I need, you know, to be in a community. I, I had a studio from home in Chicago, and I was like, you can't like invite curators over to your house to come into your... You can, but it's awkward. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I just need to reach out to all the building owners and be like, what do you got? You know, and I found this space here in the basement. I've been here for five years. And I love it here. The owners are awesome. Everybody's engaged and wants to make it work. What's difficult is that there's so much happening outside of these walls, but it, we're all open at the same damn time. And so, right. you know, when I... Sometimes I'll just close down for a first Thursday and just go to another building, and it's like, holy shit, man. There's some really, I mean, not everything is for me, right? and that's fine, but God, there's so much amazing shit happening right here. And then part of it is like, I feel like nobody knows about it, you know? Yeah. So I'm just like, come to Minneapolis, come to Minneapolis, <laughs> come to Minneapolis, buy some art, goddammit. Because it's fucking great. Yeah. And, um,. That's also part of its charm, is that it's not a super competitive commercial art market. I mean, most of, apparently there was a commercial scene uh, of galleries back in the day, and that I'm not entirely sure why that closed down, but there's a lot of galleries, most of them are non-profit or, um, you know, DIY spaces. This is a great place to be uh, an individual artist. There's not as much of a commercial scene. So if you want to be represented, you go to other markets, other cities, whatever. Um, but here you can have your own practice. You can find an audience. There's 
amazing grant infrastructure uh, in the city and within the state that you can, you know, it's competitive because there's a lot of artists here, a lot of great artists here, but you can make that work. And yeah. um, there's just a lot of an appreciation for what it is to be an artist here that I really dig. And it's lovely. I'm very lucky. Cool. My wife is very smart for making me move her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you got, Colette? Empty bladder? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, is there anything that you want to talk about that we didn't talk about? Uh, I think it's important whenever you have a platform to talk about how we're on stolen land right now. And I think that's, I think that you were talking earlier um, before we started recording about land ownership and how you, uh, you mixed feelings about that or maybe not mixed, but I'm interested as someone who owns a home and technically owns land and still, you know, and then knowing like, oh, well, this, all this land was stolen. Well, that makes me feel like a piece of shit. So <laughs> what do we do about that? I don't know. <laughs> what's your, what's your, if you don't mind me interviewing you, what's your take on land ownership? Uh, I think that, like you said when we were talking about this earlier, there's a difference between an improvement that is that it, that somebody has built on a piece of real estate mm. and the actual ground on which it stands, right? Um, like a house isn't thing. There is a house that somebody built mm -hmm. that somebody else bought, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <laughs> the the the. The long dead white man, whose uh, whose book I actually um, is one of the most important books I've ever read. It's called Poverty and Progress. Hmm. This, this guy um, Henry George, who was a journalist in the late uh, 1900s, looked at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and could trace uh, progress and poverty on almost the same curve. Mm. Uh, progress being um, our uh, increasing ability to cr create necessities and poverty being defined as people who were willing and able to work a job but weren't able to keep pace mm. and make do, mm. right? And he attributed that to the leveraging of prime real estate by people who have owned it through generations. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole fucking 40 minute diatribe. But Killer Mike from Run the Jewels mm -hmm. put it way more concisely uh, in an interview that I, that I saw a couple of years ago. And I'm probably butchering this attribution, mm -hmm. but um, he basically said if you were born on this planet and you're being charged rent by somebody else who was born on this planet, where is the logic in that? <laughs> okay. Huh. And use of, a, use of a shelter is different than being charged rent for a piece of property. Mm. Those are different things. And what Henry George's more uh, pragmatic and mechanical um, justification for that is, is the property value for um, an improved pr piece of land, the, the property, property taxes for an improved piece of land mm -hmm. should be just below the rent that that land could command without the improvements on it. Mm. Um, and so if it's in the center of town next to all the shipping, and it, it, this is a book written in 1895 or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, if it's in the center of town, 
next to all the shipping thoroughfares and stuff. That's a prime piece of property. Mm-hmm. And the owner, quote unquote, owner of that property should be given a maintenance leeway uh, before you start taxing up to that floor, right? Hmm. But um, the property tax should basically be the value of the land, Mm -hmm. Hmm. is the idea. And you could charge rent on the house, but not the underlying land. So then you're not really, you're not making any money, is the idea, right? The idea is, and this this is me, this is me, Yes. Yeah. This is me putting my own spin on the thing, and right. that the, my characterization of the thing is that, especially through the generations, you know, because I was born to privileged white parents, mm-hmm. I should not be unjustly enriched mm-hmm. because they owned a piece of property back in the day, or my great grandparents owned a piece of property back in the day. It's so right? funny that you phrase it as un- unjustly enriched because the people who are against. You know, uh, state taxes, for instance, would consider that an unjust taxation or something. Well, my parents earned that, and you know, that's that's that separate realities thing. Well, you know? then I'll harshen up. I'll harshen up Killer Mike's rhetoric a little bit. <laughs> oh, really? You mean to harshen up Killer Mike? That's funny. <laughs> it's just like, it's like, oh, I fell out of a rich vagina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why am I better than somebody who did? No, I agree with you. You yeah. know, <laughs> no, it's just that that's the same language that they use around justice. You know, for like this is unjust that you're saying that just because I'm rich I have to pay more well, you know, or something. And, and then, and, but that's how we think differently about society. And, and this like, is our the, responsibility. This is know? the subtext to what Obama got in trouble for saying hmm. is that you didn't create that. Yeah, you know, yeah, and and it was probably what he meant, but he was able to claim plausible deniability. Well, he was talking about he was talking about fucking interstates. Yeah, he was saying like, look, when you own a business, you have you're using all of this public infrastructure to run your business, and you didn't pay for that. You didn't like that wasn't like you built your business from the sweat of your brow, sure, mm-hmm. but you didn't build I ninety four with the sweat of your fucking brow. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is, that is, I think, I, I, you know, it's been so goddamn long since I've had to quarrel about that particular thing, but it's, I think that was basically like, dude, socialism is a thing, you know, like, we, we all pool our money and we build these things and then we have to keep them up, you know, and this is, this is what publicly owned things, this is how it works, you know. I live next to this supposedly conservative person. Uh, anti-government or whatever, sure. and you know, it's it, we we had a conversation earlier that's very parallel to this. But this person doesn't want to pay for uh, infrastructure and social services, but the social contract that he owns that house next to me is the only reason that somebody else isn't occupying it. Yeah. The, the the wards of the state who are the police that enforce his property rights. Mm-hmm. That you know, that those that social program that the entire community agreed to pay for yeah. is the only reason that somebody who's a little bit stronger with a little bit better weaponry isn't occupying his house. Yeah, of course. You know? I know. And so oh, it's like God, I had this I had this uh, this Cuban. I went to law school with this Cuban guy and I got this conversation with him and he sort of I identified me as a potential socialist or whatever and he mm-hmm. asked me like can you name a socialist country that's successful and I was like yeah I can name about 10 of them well let's start here the United States of America yep. uh, you know we've got a ton of social programs that secure oil and make sure that uh, brown people aren't coming across our borders I mean you we know? got our garbage picked up yeah <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe, maybe, maybe we have gone so far afield uh, that this doesn't sound like something that I think is not okay. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. Just That's a cool yeah. 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 Store that there. Yeah. Not everybody, okay. Everybody should know. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck ice. <laughs> the poor ice it. and the DEA. Uh, Put that out there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, so I, I like how my garbage picked up. So let's, <laughs> yeah. I'm down know. with the police. I think we should pay them more. Sure. We I pay mean, them more so know. we get better people. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, that's a whole. There's a lot of people that are interested in finding a new model for community policing that I'm interested in learning more about. And I, I the best I can do is say that I don't know enough about it mm -hmm. to speak intelligently on it. Other than that, uh, as Jenny Holzer, another uh, great artist, uh, said, she's got a. She works with words a lot, and one of her phrases is uh, "abuse of power comes as no surprise." And so, whenever, Ooh, whenever, I you, love that. whenever you give anyone power, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, what's the best way to structure? I mean, this is uh, this will be the third time Bill Hicks came up, and maybe this is a good place to end it. But that um, this is all made up. Oh yeah, I mean. When he were, he's talking about the economy, it's like the economy that's fucking made up anyway, you know? It's like, especially now when it's mostly just ones and zeros. Um, we don't have to live like this. Yeah. I mean, there's been many cultures who've lived differently. There's been, uh, even our own culture has lived differently in the not so distant past. And if we can be a little bit more creative in our thinking and empathetic, interactions and maybe we can find a happy medium but I feel like we're kind of like at this point culturally where everybody's just squaring up and going to their corners and like mm -mm. nah motherfucker we're gonna fight you know and it's just like okay I don't know maybe we could like we'll have you, don't to have to be, you don't have to be pro or you have to be anti there's a third way yeah. and that's hard because there's many many years of power and and they're built on privilege and exploitation and, and every terrible thing under the sun that give us everything marvelous about modern life, so... Uh, we're doomed. <laughs> okay, plug your stick down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so go to rust-white.com. Um, okay. Yeah, this has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to your projections, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Cool, we did it. We did it. All right, guys, we did it. Um, you know, I haven't seen Russ in 16 years or something like that. Uh, we were really tight in college, and and the year after I finished college. Um, and it's so cool when you when you hook back up with somebody you haven't seen in a long time. It feels like you you talked to him 15 minutes ago. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you so much for sticking around. If you're still here. Um, go to fromthevan.com and do whatever you want with whatever's there and uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday with another episode of From the Van <laughs>